Lou Gehrig, The Luckiest Man. Nineteen o three was a year of great beginnings. Henry Ford sold his first automobile, and the Wright brothers made the first successful flight in an airplane. In baseball, the first World Series was played. The team, later known as the Yankees, moved from Baltimore to New York. And on June 19, 1903, Henry Louis Gehrig was born. He would become one of the greatest baseball players in baseball history. Lou Gehrig was born in the Yorkville section of New York City. It was an area populated with poor immigrants like his parents, Henrik and Christina Gehrig, who had come to the United States from Germany. Christina Garrick had great hopes for her son, Lou. She dreamed that he would attend college and become an accountant or an engineer. She insisted that he study hard. Through eight years of grade school, Lou didn't miss a single day. Lou's mother thought games and sports were a waste of time, but Lou loved sports. He got up early to play the games he loved, baseball, soccer, and football. He played until it was time to go to school. In high school, Lou was a star on his school's baseball team. After high school, Lou Gehrig went to Columbia University. He was on the baseball team there too. And on April 26, 1923, a scout for the New York Yankees watched him play. Lou hit two long home runs in that game. Soon after that, he was signed to play for the Yankees. The Yankees offered Lou a $1,500 bonus to sign, plus a good salary. His family needed the money. Lou quit college and joined the Yankees. Lou's mother was furious. She was convinced that he was ruining his life. On June 1, 1925, the Yankee manager sent Lou to bat for the shortstop. The next day, Lou played in place of first baseman Willie Pat, Wally Pip. Those were the first two games and what would become an amazing record. For the next 14 years, Lou Gehrig played in 2,130 consecutive Yankee games. The boy who never missed a day of grad grade school became a man who never missed a game. Lou Gehrig played despite stomach aches, fevers, a sore arm, back pains, and broken fingers. Lou's constant play earned him the nickname Iron Horse. All he would say about his amazing record was, that's the way I am. Lou was shy and modest, but people who watched him knew just how good he was. In 1927, Lou's teammate, Babe Ruth, hit 60 home runs, the most hit up to that time in one season. But it was Lou Gehrig who was selected that year by the baseball writers as the American League's most valuable player. He was selected again as the league's MVP in 1936. Then, during the 1938 baseball season, and for no apparent reason, Lou Gehrig stopped hitting. One newspaper reported that Lou was swinging as hard as he could, but when he hit the ball, it didn't go anywhere. Lou exercised, he took extra batting practice, he even tried changing the way he stood and held his bat. He worked hard during the winter of 1938 and watched his diet. But the following spring, Lou's playing was worse. Time after time, he swung at the ball and missed. He had trouble fielding, and he even had problems off the field. In the clubhouse, he fell down while he was getting dressed. Some people said Yankee manager Joe McCarthy should take Lou out of the lineup, but McCarthy refused. He had great respect for Lou and said Garrick plays as long as he wants to play. But Lou wasn't selfish. On May 2nd, 1939, he told Joe McCarthy, I'm benching myself for the good of the team. When reporters asked why he took himself out, Lou didn't say he felt weak or how hard it was for him to run. Lou made no excuses. He just said that he couldn't hit and he couldn't field. On June 13, 1939, Lou went to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota to be examined by specialists. On June 19, his 36th birthday, they told Lou's wife, Eleanor, what was wrong. He was suffering from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a deadly disease that affects the central nervous system. But Yankee fans and the team wanted to do more. Oops, skipped a page. Lou stayed with the team, but he didn't play. He was losing weight, his hair was turning gray. He didn't have to be told he was dying. He knew it. I don't have long to go, he told a teammate. Lou loved going to the games, being in the clubhouse and sitting with his teammates. 
Before each game, Lou brought the Yankee lineup card to the umpire at home plate. A teammate or coach walked with him to make sure he didn't fall. Whenever Lou came into the field, the fans stood up and cheered for brave Lou Gehrig. But the Yankee fans and the team wanted to do more. They wanted Lou to know how deeply they felt about him. So they made July 4th, 1939, Lou Gehrig Appreciation Day at Yankee Stadium. Many of the players from the 1927 Yankees, perhaps the best baseball team ever, came to honor their former teammate. There was a marching band and gifts. Many people spoke too. Forella LaGuardia, the mayor of New York City, told Lou, you are the greatest prototype of good sportsmanship and citizenship. When the time came for Lou to thank everyone, he was too moved to speak, but the fans wanted to hear him and chanted, we want Garrick, we want Garrick. Dressed in his Yankee uniform, Lou Gehrig walked slowly to the array of microphones. He wiped his eyes and his baseball cap in his hand, his head down, he slowly spoke. Fans, he said, for the past two weeks, you have been reading about a bad break I got, yet today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. It was a courageous speech. Lou didn't complain about his terrible illness. Instead, he spoke of his many blessings and of the future. Sure, I'm lucky, he said, when he spoke of his years in baseball. Sure, I'm lucky, he said, again, when he spoke of his fans and family. Lou spoke about how good people had been to him. He praised his teammates. He thanked his parents and his wife, whom he called a tower of strength. The more than 60,000 fans in Yankee Stadium stood to honor Lou Gehrig, his last words to them, and to the many thousands more sitting by their radios and listening were, so I close in saying, that I might have had a bad break, but I have an awful lot to live for. Thank you. Lou stepped back from the microphones and wiped his eyes. The stadium crowd let out a tremendous roar, and Babe Ruth did what many people must have wanted to do that day. He threw his arms around Lou Gehrig and gave him a great warm hug. The band played the song, I Love You Truly, and the fans chanted, We Love You, Lou. When Lou Gehrig left the stadium later that afternoon, he told a teammate, I'm going to remember this day for a long time. In December 1939, Lou Gehrig was voted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and the Yankees retired his uniform. No one else in the team would ever wear the number four. It was the first time a Major League Baseball team did that to honor one of its players. Mayor Ferrelli LaGuardia thought Lou's courage might inspire some of the city's troubled youths to be courageous too. He offered Lou a job working with former prisoners as a member of the New York City Parole Commission. Lou had many opportunities to earn more money, but he believed this job would enable him to do something for the city that had given him so much. Within little more than a year, Lou had to leave his job. He was too weak to keep working. He stayed at home, unable to do the simplest tasks. Lou had many visitors. He didn't speak to them of his illness or of dying. When he saw one friend visibly upset by the way he looked, Lou told him not to worry. I'll gradually get better, he said. In cards to his friends, Lou wrote, we have much to be thankful for. By the middle of May, 1941, Lou hardly left his bed. Then on Monday, June 2nd, 1941, just after 10 o'clock at night, Lou Gehrig died. He was 37 years old. On June 4th, the Yankee game was canceled because of rain. Some people thought it was fitting that the Yankees did not play. This was the day of Lou Gehrig's funeral. At the funeral, the minister announced that there would be no speeches. We need none, he said, because you all knew him. That seemed fitting too for modest Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig the luckiest man.